Good evening, friends. It's lovely to see you. We are busy with our series, Revelation of Hope. And tonight's topic is Revelation's Sign of Allegiance in Earth's Last Conflict. In 1991, the COBE satellite produced the discovery of the century. COBE stands for Cosmic Background Explorer. Astronomers, astrophysicists, and the cosmologists were astounded. This discovery sent shockwaves throughout the realm of science. They found that the information that was being gathered by this satellite was proving that this universe has a beginning. You see, you only have two choices. Either matter has always existed or God has always existed. And this information was proving that matter didn't always exist, but that it had a beginning. COBE data regarding the universe indicated that it has a definite beginning. This is science. Hugh Ross wrote in his book, The Creator and the Cosmos, The measured proportion exactly fit the proportion you would expect if the universe had a beginning. That's what the COBE satellite told us. A Berkeley astronomer spoke about this discovery of the satellite. What we have found is evidence of the birth of the universe. It's like looking at God. Yes, friends, God has left His fingerprints in creation. Everywhere there's evidence that there is a Creator. They have found that if there is a creation, there must be a Creator. If there is a beginning, there must be a beginner. God's fingerprints are everywhere. Yes, scientists that are functioning in an atheistic, scientific, materialistic society are acknowledging that there is evidence of a creator when we look at the world around us. The book of Revelation is pointing us to the very throne room of God. John in vision is called to look up higher. Come up here and I will show you things which must take place after this. This is Revelation 4 verse 1. He looks up and he sees the throne room of God surrounded by 24 elders. He sees holy beings falling down and worshipping God. He hears this song, Revelation 4 verse 8. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. Friends, we don't exist just by accident. We are just not um, the combination of molecules, and by chance things have come out the way they are. No, friends, there is design. There is a designer. Before you were formed in your mother's womb, you existed in the mind of God. He fashioned us. He formed us. He made us. This is one of the most amazing things for me. 
you know, I have um, some background in, in the veterinary science field, and I had a special burden for reproduction, and especially in the area of embryology. I was wanting to specialize in that area, the transferring of embryos. And you know, when you look at a uterus, it's empty. Think of a bag, it's empty. But then out of that emptiness come bones, hard bones, a skull, teeth, femur, humerus, tibia, fibula. Mention the bones. Isn't that amazing? Bones coming out of that bag. That just boggles my mind. Revelation is calling us to worship the Creator, the One who made us. Revelation 7 verse 12. Thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Revelation 10 verse 6. Him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are in it, the earth and the things that are in it, and the sea and the things that are in it. This is all em encompassing. This is comprehensive. There's nothing that we can see that has not been created by our loving Creator. In Revelation 10, there's an angel with one foot on the land and one foot on the sea. This means this message is for the whole world. It's a universal message calling people to worship the true God. Now the question is, how did we lose this concept of God as Creator? How did we lose it? In 1831, a British ship, the Beagle, made an epic journey. This ship went to an area called the Galapagos Islands. There was a young scientist on this ship. His name was Charles Darwin. And as he studied the bird life on these islands, he noticed that there was a great variety within the same species. And also among the turtles, he saw the same. And he came to the conclusion that We originated through slow change from the very most simple forms of life to the complex forms of life. Charles Darwin promoted a radically different view of creation. In his view, there was no need for a creator God anymore. Darwin's book, The Origin of Species transformed the way millions looked at the world. This new worldview had no place for a creator. Yes, in his view, we have monkeys for our great-grandparents. Out went the creator God. No need for him anymore. And sadly, this theory has infiltrated our society today, our schools, our universities, and even churches have been affected by this. There's a certain belief called theistic evolution that is impacting Christianity today. But the book of Revelation is calling us to worship our Creator, and for us to understand the book of Revelation, which is the book of endings, we need to go to the book of beginnings. We need to go and see where did we come from. And the question that we have to answer tonight, did God give us a reminder of His creation? Did God give us a sign? Did God give us a symbol? Something to protect us 
from the false theories that are being bombarded upon us every day. Yes, in the book of Revelation, there's a call going forth, a call to worship our Creator. Revelation 14 verse 7, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. And worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. This quote comes directly from the Old Testament. How do we worship the Creator of heaven and earth? What does He ask of us? Is there a certain way that He wants us to come to Him? Has He given us something special to identify us with Him? Him as the Creator and us as His creatures. Yes, friends, to understand the book of endings, we need to go to the book of beginnings. To understand the book of Revelation, we have to turn back to the very first book in the Bible, the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis tells us that the world as we see it today was created in six literal consecutive days. Six literal consecutive 24-hour days. It was a dark mass God created light. He created an atmosphere. He separated the waters and the dry land. Rivers and lakes appeared. Trees and grass and flowers and shrubs. Beautiful birds and fish. Beautiful animals were all created by a loving God. And every day He said, It is good. He placed the sun and the moon and the stars in the heavens. But as the crowning act of His creation, He created in Genesis 1, 26 and 27, He created someone in His image. This is so beautiful. Let us make man in our image. In the image of God, He created him. Male and female, He created them. This was what God was waiting for. He was waiting to have someone to talk to, someone to relate to, someone to share His love with. And the beauty was all placed there for our ancestors Adam and Eve. Genesis 2 verse 1, Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. Some people might say, but this is a lot of work, you know, to do in six days, but not for God. Psalm 33 verse 9 says, For He spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. I've mentioned before, He created ex nihilo, Out of nothing. He just spoke and it was there. This is so incredible. And we can see Adam and Eve there at the end of the sixth day as the sun is dipping over the western horizon horizon, and they are looking and seeing all the beauties that God has made. But this is not the end of the creation account. Genesis 2, verse 2 and 3. And on the seventh day, God ended His work, which He had done. And He rested on the seventh day from all His work, which He had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it He rested from all His work, which He had created and made. Was God tired after creating? No, He wasn't tired. But he wanted to sit down and enjoy and absorb the beauty of everything that he had made. He blessed this day. He sanctified this day. And he rested on this day. 
three very important things that happened on the seventh day of the week. The seventh day Sabbath, given at creation, was to be God's perpetual reminder of our roots. You know, sometimes um, there's something in the family, something that gets handed over from generation to generation. My dad um, had this little spoon, a little silver spoon with his initials on it that he got when he was a baby. And when my brother and I grew up, he said, well, the one who has the first son can have the spoon. But I still wonder why he didn't give the spoon to me because I was the oldest boy. Somehow he missed that one. But he had the spoon and then we had two girls and Hannah um, has got the curly hair from his side of the family and her little toes, little baby toes, look just like his toes. So I said, well, um, this isn't a boy, but she's got your toes and uh, so you better give the spoon to her. So my dad said, no, he's waiting for the first grandson. So I said, well, my brother will have to, you know, take care of that one. But amazingly, before my brother's first child was born, Vilna fell pregnant again, and Caleb was born six months before his little boy cousin. So Caleb won the race. <laughs> and my dad then presented the spoon to Caleb. So this has become a little, call it a tradition now in the family, the spoon. The seventh day Sabbath, given at creation, was to be God's perpetual reminder of our roots. Something having the initials of the Creator. Something that's carried, carried over from generation to generation to remind us where do we come from? Which family do we belong to? Who are we? The seventh day is the crowning of the creation week. It's a special day. My children look at this picture and they say, the Sabbath is the big one. It's the special one. It is blessed. It is sanctified. It's different to all the others. God blessed it, number one. He sanctified it, number two. And God rested on it, number three. You know, God knew that in our busy world, we would need rest. He doesn't need the rest, but He knew that we need the rest. And that's why He calls all humanity to rest and worship on the seventh day of the week. God blessed the seventh day by making it an eternal sign of His powerful creation and infinite love. The word sanctified is the same word that's used in the Bible when it comes to marriage. Now, you can imagine, here is a couple. They have just said their vows. This woman has been set aside. She's been set apart. She's been sanctified for this husband. And then, after the ceremony, the bridegroom is sitting in the car, ready that they can go on honeymoon. Now, the bride has six sisters, and they were all bridesmaids at the wedding. And suddenly, one of the sisters comes running to the car, and she jumps in and sits behind him and said, Let's go! And he looks at her, and he's shocked. And he said, But I didn't marry you. She says, But what does it matter? I'm one in seven. He said, no, I didn't marry you. I married your sister. She's my wife. And just as sisters are different, so days are different. They are not the same. 
You can't just say one in seven is okay. No, we have to ask which one was set aside, which one was sanctified, which one was blessed. Yes, friends, Jesus met with Adam and Eve on that first Sabbath day. The first Sabbath that this world ever saw. And he showed them the beauties of nature, of creation. It must have been a wonderful day. No sin, no curse, no pain, no problems. Everything beautiful, everything wonderful. And throughout the Old and New Testament, the Sabbath has always been there as a reminder that God is the creator of the universe. God is the creator of heaven and earth. God is calling us to true worship. And the only one who deserves our worship is the one who created us. What do you say? It can't be anyone else. The one who created us deserves our worship. And the Sabbath is a sign of creation. Before the Israelites got the law, the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, they were keeping the seventh day Sabbath. And this is the story of the manna. Exodus 16 verse 26. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, there will be none. Now this is a miracle that God did. It's amazing. Every day, the first day, the second day, the third, the fourth, the fifth day, there was a portion of manna that fell. But on the sixth day, there was a double portion. Now if you kept over manna from the fourth day, and you wanted to keep it till the fifth day, the morning of the fifth day, you would look and there were worms. It went off. It went rotten. But on the sixth day, a double portion fell. You must read this in your Bible. Exodus 16. And then on the seventh day, when people went out to collect, there was, there was nothing. And that double portion that was kept over, it was fine. It was still fresh. Isn't that amazing? But if you kept that over to the first day, it would go off. You had to pick up one, two, three, four, five. On the sixth day, double. And on the seventh day, there was nothing. So God did this weekly miracle to remind the Israelites who had been in bondage under the whips of the Egyptians that there is a Sabbath day to keep the Sabbath day to worship God. And what did God say when some of the disobedient Israelites went out on the Sabbath to gather manna and found none? What did He say? How long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? This means that this commandment existed before Sinai. What do you say? It had to be there before, because they haven't reached Sinai yet. Sinai is still coming. The Ten Commandments written down in stone are still coming. But these commandments already existed. There's a beautiful study that was done. The Ten Commandments before Sinai. And this theologian has proved that every single commandment existed before they got to that mountain. They were there. For 2,300 years, the laws of God, the commandments of God were there for humanity. And God wrote the Sabbath commandment with His own finger in stone. He wrote it so that it will be a perpetual sign throughout all generations. God didn't write it in sand that it can be washed away. He didn't write it on parchment that it can be destroyed in fire. He didn't write it on a piece of paper and leave it there in the corner. No, He wrote it with His own finger in stone, God wrote the law to endure forever. He wrote it personally. He didn't tell Moses to write it even. 
It was something that he did personally. This tells me something that it must be important. And this is what the commandment says, Exodus 20, verse 8 to 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Why did God say remember? That's the very first word in the commandment. Because God knew that we will be living in a society of evolution, of atheism, a society where God is forgotten. And that's why he says, remember, remember the Sabbath. Remember that I am your creator. I am the one who formed you. I am the one who gave you life. I am the one who is sustaining you. Remember our sign. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. I want you to take note that it's the Sabbath of who? Of the Lord your God. That word there you can see is written in capitals. It's the personal name of God. In it you shall do no work. Friends, the origin of the Sabbath is the Creator Himself. It doesn't come from some priest or some pope or some pastor or some church council. No, it comes from God Himself. He is holy. He is the only one that can make something holy. Friends, we can only keep something holy. We cannot make it holy. Are we together? So God sanctified the Sabbath. He made it holy. He filled it with Himself because He is holy. We can only keep it holy. It's not a seventh day. I want you to take note. It is the seventh day. It's a definite article. The seventh day is the Sabbath. And just like the day before your birthday is not your birthday, and the day after your birthday is not your birthday, so you can't just choose any day that commemorates the birthday of the earth. The earth was created in six days. The seventh day is the birthday. It's the day to commemorate the creation of the planet. Exodus 20, verse 8 to 11. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. It doesn't say the first day, the third day, the fifth day. It says the seventh day. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. This is taking us to creation week. The Sabbath is telling us that we were created. We just didn't evolve. We didn't come out of some primordial soup, little mollusks, and somehow, this is one of the things that the scientists actually can't, um, can't defend. Because the DNA of those little, you know, one-celled organisms is not possible scientifically to Im increase the DNA. You can go less, but you can't go more. So that's one of the things that they can't explain. We did not evolve. We were created. The Sabbath was never an exclusively Jewish institution. It was given for all humanity. You know, friends, for 2,300 years there was no Jew on the planet. The Sabbath comes from creation. It doesn't come from when the Jewish race began. Isaiah 56. Let me say this first. The commandment that says, Thou shalt not commit 
adultery, is that for Jews only? The one that says, thou shalt not steal, is that for Jews only? The one that says, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, is that for Jews only? The Sabbath is for all humanity, not just for Jews. Isaiah 56 verse 6 and 7, Everyone who keeps from defiling the Sabbath, I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for who? For the Jews? For all nations. People from India, China, South America, the islands, Central Africa, Australia, name it. God is calling people from right around the planet to come to His holy mountain. What is that talking about? It's talking about the new Jerusalem. Mount Zion. Who of you has been to Jerusalem in Israel? Anyone? You've got to go up. It's a, it's a long uphill. We went in an old bus. And I'm telling you, that bus, it was so hot that day, it was chugging up that mountain. I thought we're never going to make it. And eventually we got to Jerusalem. Mount Zion. Now when God says He's calling everyone to His holy mountain, it's talking about the new Jerusalem. You see, the Sabbath is the golden link between the past and the future. Between the Creator and the Recreator. Revelation is the future. Genesis is the past. And the Sabbath is the link between the two. Yes, God wrote it with His own finger. In stone. Throughout the Old Testament, the Sabbath was kept by God's people. Ezekiel 20 verse 12 gives us a very special insight. Moreover, I also gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between them and me, that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. You see, God doesn't only create us, but He also wants to recreate us. He wants to give us a new heart. A new life in Christ. The Sabbath was given to Adam and Eve. It was once again reminded to Moses and the children of Israel. Written on stone. It's perpetual. But some will ask, well, now what about the New Testament? What about Christ? What did He do? What was His custom? Luke 4 verse 16. So He came to Nazareth where He had been brought up. And as His custom was. What's your custom? Something that you do always, isn't it? Repeatedly. He went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. Well, some people might say he was, a, he was a Jew. That's why he did it. Well, friends, he is the Savior of mankind. And if he was planning to change the seventh-day Sabbath, he would have done it, wouldn't he? He would have said, no, 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 things have changed now. We're doing it differently now. No, he just kept on the custom. His lifestyle was to worship his Heavenly Father on the Sabbath. Mark 2 verse 27, it says the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. It wasn't made for the Jews, friends. It was made for mankind. For mankind. Are Jews men? Yes. So it's made for them too, but not just for them. It's not just for them. The Sabbath is a sign that we worship Him exclusively. That we love Him supremely. It's a special day. It's a day filled with God's presence. 
If we do not keep it, we are losing connection with our Creator. We rest in a completed creation, in a completed redemption. What's so amazing is that Christ, our Creator, after creating this world and Adam and Eve, He rested on the seventh day. He completed the work on the sixth day and He rested on the seventh day. Jesus, our Savior, He completed the work of redemption on the sixth day. Remember, He said it's finished and He rested on the seventh day. We rest in a completed creation, in a completed redemption. The Sabbath reminds us of our origin and also of our future. It's a sign that we were created and it's a sign that we have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Yes, friends, the Sabbath is in the heart of God's Ten Commandments. His commandments of love. And He says, if you love Me, keep My commandments. John 14, verse 15. Jesus went about doing good on the Sabbath. In the morning, He was in the synagogue, reading the Scriptures, sharing the Word of God. And then on Sabbath afternoons, you find Him being a blessing to humanity. He did not have anything against the Sabbath. The problem that he had was all the human traditions that had been added to the Sabbath. The things that man had made. And it was, the Sabbath was so covered with human tradition that it was losing its beauty. So Jesus came to cut away all the human tradition surrounding the Sabbath. And that's why I said in Matthew 12, 12, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. It's lawful to relieve suffering on the Sabbath. Yes, even in His death, Christ kept the Sabbath. He died on the preparation day, on the sixth day, on the Friday afternoon. He was laid in the tomb and even his followers went to rest. And Jesus says, if you love me, what? Keep my commandments. His followers went and kept the Sabbath. They didn't even anoint and embalm his body. You know, that was an important work to do, isn't it? But they left that. Christ is resting in the tomb. They went to rest according to the commandment. And if anyone would have known that Christ had changed the Sabbath, it would have been His closest followers. Do you agree with me? And there, hanging on the cross, we see our Savior. And He is saying, Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me enough to follow me all the way? Do you love me enough to sacrifice your pleasures? To leave the world behind and come and worship me on the day that I have sanctified, blessed, and filled with my presence. Jesus was speaking to his disciples one day, and he was telling them about the destruction of Jerusalem. And he told them that they must pray, this is in Matthew 24, that your flight may not be in the winter or on the Sabbath. Now this is a very important verse. Because Christ died in 31 AD. And 40 days after he was raised from the dead. He ascended to his father. Jerusalem was destroyed when? In 70 AD. That's when it was destroyed. So Christ is talking about the future. And if the Sabbath had ended with his crucifixion, why would he say to them, you must pray that you don't have to flee on the Sabbath, which was about 40 years later. Are we together? So he's giving some guidelines to his followers. These are the closest followers of Jesus. They saw him. They knew him. 
They walked with him. Yes, friends, the Romans came the first time in 66 AD under Cestius. And what's so amazing, Josephus tells us that it was actually on the Sabbath that the Romans came. But the followers of Christ, the Christians in Jerusalem, were praying. And it was amazing that the Romans withdrew. And then Christ's followers could leave Jerusalem safely. They crossed the Jordan and they went to a little place called Pella. And then in 70 AD, Titus resumed the siege. And it was destroyed by the Romans. The temple was burnt. And you know the story about the destruction of Jerusalem. But Jesus warned his followers that you must pray that you don't flee on the Sabbath. Now some people might say time, times have changed. Maybe time has been lost. Has time ever been lost? Well, let's have a look. How can you know which day the Sabbath is? There are three very important sources. The Bible, language, and astronomy. The Bible, language, and astronomy. We know that the Sabbath was given for the first time to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. It was reiterated to Moses on Mount Sinai. So from there, we know that it's been consistent. And then from Moses to Christ, we know through the example of Jesus, which day is the Sabbath. Especially the events surrounding his death make it very, very clear which day is the Sabbath, which day of the week is the day that God has called us to worship. Luke 23, verse 54 to 24, verse 1. That day was the preparation, and the Sabbath drew near. And the woman who had come with him from Galilee followed after, and they observed the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils, and they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. Three days are identified here. Number one is the preparation day. It's the sixth day of the week. It's the day that the Israelites had to pick up the double portion of manna. Are we together? And then it's the... Sabbath day. And we know the followers of Christ, they went and rested according to the commandment. And then it talks about another day. Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb bringing the spices which they had prepared. So we have the day of preparation. We have the Sabbath and we have the first day. Do you see it clearly in the verse? Three days that are mentioned. Now let's look at the order of events. Christ died on the cross on which day? It's the preparation day. And Christians today call it Good Friday. We all know that. Good Friday. And then... Christ was in the tomb on the Sabbath day. Which day follows Friday? It's Saturday. And then Christ rose on the first day of the week. Many Christians call it Easter Sunday. So it's Easter Sunday. Christ rose on the Sunday morning. And I want to ask you, if this is in any way doubtful in your mind, go to a good Dictionary or a good encyclopedia and look up second day of the week or Monday. Check Monday, check Wednesday, check Thursday, check Friday and see what does it say. If you look at Monday, it's going to say second day of the week. If you look at Friday, it's going to say sixth day of the week. Go and check. And you'll see Sunday is the first day and Saturday is the seventh day. There are eight texts in the New Testament that mention the first day of the week and not one of them tells us to worship on Sunday in honor of 
the resurrection. There are eight texts. And you can go through them, and none of them speak of sanctity being added to Sunday. Christ has given us a symbol of the resurrection. You know, many people say, well, they honor Sunday because Christ rose on that day. I'm sure many of you have heard this before. Christ rose on the first day of the week. That's why they keep that day holy. Well, what, the New Testament has given us a symbol for the resurrection. Romans 6, verse 3 and 4. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? So, when you are baptized, you die to sin, and then you are baptized into His death. Therefore, we were buried with Him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So here's a beautiful symbol of the, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. And that is in baptism. Baptism. In over 140 languages of the world, the word of the seventh day of the week is Sabbath. Does anyone speak Portuguese here? I know we have some Portuguese friends that um, sometimes visit here. It's the work, it's the word sábado. Sábado. Can you say sábado? Sábado. And it's the same in Spanish. Sábado. God rested on the sábado. He sanctified the sábado. The sábado is the sign, and Christ kept the sábado. You can hear it. It's the Sabbath. If you look at Russian, Polish, sobota, sabota, Arabic is asabit, and there's 140 languages where you can actually see that the word for Saturday is Sabbath. It's embedded in the language. We can go to a very trustworthy source, the Royal Greenwich Observatory, Greenwich, England. And here we will learn that no time has been lost. The calendar was changed in 1582 by Pope Gregory XIII. He noticed that the, the time and the, and the months were moving away from the seasons. So he worked in a plan and he said, okay... The calendar is going to be changed. The Julian calendar was going to be replaced by the Gregorian calendar. So the 4th of October, 1582, was followed by the 15th of October, 1582. But did the order of the days of the week change? Is there any change there? We can see there's Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Nothing happened to the order of the days of the week. So from Adam to Moses, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Christ, Peter, James and John, Paul, we have the assurance that the Sabbath has remained the same. Here in the New Testament, Acts 17, verse 1 and 2, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Then Paul, as his custom was, you can see it's also Paul's custom, went into them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures. Which day did he choose to go and reason about the Scriptures? On the Sabbath day. The Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. So here's the Gentiles that are asking. And the following Sabbath, Paul teaches them. Acts 13 verse 44. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. These are Gentiles that have come together on the Sabbath. 16 verse 13. And on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily made. And we sat down and spoke to the woman 
who met there. Here you have women, God-fearing women, meeting together on the banks of a river on which day? On the Sabbath day. Yes, friends, the book of Revelation is pointing us to the Creator God. The book of Revelation is calling us to true worship, to worship the one who made heaven and earth, the sea, the fountains and the springs of water. He's, we are being called to worship God as our Creator. And some people then will say, well, I worship the Lord I keep the Lord's day. Revelation 1 verse 10. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Now does this verse say which day it is? Does it say that this is Sunday? Is that what the verse says? It doesn't say it. We need to go to the Scriptures. Remember I told you we mustn't superimpose our own ideas onto the Scriptures. We must let the Scriptures speak to us. So let's find out which is the Lord's day. Which is the day of Jesus? Matthew 12, verse 8. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Mark 2, verse 28. Therefore the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. Luke 6, verse 5. The Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. And when God says something three times, you think it's important? I think so. So Christ is Lord of the Sabbath. The Lord's day is the Sabbath day. It's so beautiful. That on this special day, a sign, a covenant day, a, a day that shows that we are made by Him and He's calling us to worship Him, that's the day when Christ appeared to John on that lowly island of Patmos. Isn't that beautiful? On the Sabbath day. The Sabbath of the Creator God in Genesis is the Lord's day of revelation. Nothing has changed. Christ never changes, and His day never changes. Revelation 14, verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. This is talking about people who are living at the end of time, who are keeping not only nine commandments, but all ten, including the seventh day Sabbath. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. The Sabbath, here are seven important points, was given at creation, was given at Sinai, kept by His people, kept by Jesus, honored by the disciples, the sign of God's power, and also kept on the new earth. Isaiah 66 verse 22 and 23, For as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your descendants and your name remain. And so, and it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. This is talking about the new heaven and the new earth. We're going to worship God on the Sabbath day, from Eden to Eden, the Sabbath remains the day that God calls His people to worship Him. Yes, friends, it's going to be so wonderful. In heaven, there's going to be so much to do. But we're not going to be able to wait for the Sabbath. Because you know who's going to be the preacher of the hour? Jesus Himself. And we'll come and worship Him with the holy angels. It's going to be something so wonderful we can't even imagine. Yes, friends, Adam and Eve kept the Sabbath. The old patriarchs kept the Sabbath. Moses and the children of Israel kept the Sabbath. Jesus kept the Sabbath. His followers kept the Sabbath. And we will keep the Sabbath. In the earth made new. And tonight we can respond and say, Lord, I want to worship you. I want to worship my Creator. I want to worship my Redeemer. I want to follow you all the way, whatever it takes.